My whole career has been spent in recruitment. Um, I operate no less than seven medical recruitment companies across England and South Africa. And my passion as a whole has always been about people and service. Um, I founded my company, the A24 Group, in 1996. And I'm still operating the business today and I have headquarters both in Cape Town and in the UK. Um, my husband, um, Nick, has a passion for boats and um, that is basically how we came across Benguela Cove, which was my entry into the hospitality business. Um, we quickly fell in love with the estate and we became homeowners and that was in um, December 2013. The estate wasn't performing, uh, 2010 actually, um, the estate wasn't performing well um, and the opportunity to acquire the whole of Benguela Cove came up in December 2013, which we, which we did. We acquired the whole residential urban vineyards and on the from the developer. Um, that left us as the new developer of this beautiful piece of paradise. And we knew nothing about wine apart from enjoying the odd glass or two ourselves. Um, but to cut a long story short, we developed a winery, tasting room facilities, children facilities, um, and Benguela Cove has become a destination for those that enjoy good food and a home for those that are lucky enough to live here. Um, the farm itself is 200 hectares and the vineyards are 70 hectares. And as you can imagine, we produce a lot of wine. And that needed us to develop a new sales strategy to sell this wine. And this took us to England. Um, in 2016, um, Nick and I purchased Manning Peace Golf Club, a beautiful quintessential English property um, set in West Sussex in England. Yeah, it had two champions. The club had absolutely everything that we needed to set up the first perfect tasting room and facilities for Benguela Cove. It had liquor licenses, car parking, great facilities, the thirsty golfers and so on. We rebranded as the Manning Peace Golf and Wine Estate, the first in England, um, and we took the opportunity to reduce one of our courses from 18 holes to nine, and we planted varietals conducive to producing English sparkling wine. So together with Benguela Cove, we had our hands completely full. But, and I say but, one day my son Adam asked me to come and look at a house he was thinking of buying. Adam had moved from South Africa to England with his family to run Manning Peace for me. And I was driving back and I spotted a for sale sign out the corner of my eye and there was Leonard Lee. I'd absolutely never heard of this place before. The property was completely overgrown and uncared for. And I discovered that it had been sold 10 years earlier um, and that the owner had just left it and had fallen to rack and ruin and eventually had gone into the hands of the liquidators. Um, it was difficult to see what was there. The mansion house, when you pushed back the doors, had water running down the walls. There were huge mushrooms growing full of mould. Um, there were deer and wallabies running free on the estate, but animal protection orders were about to be slapped on the estate as nobody had cared for the animals and so forth. So it was in a horrific state. Behind a large squeaky door, we found a dolls museum that was absolutely fantastic. It had been protected. Um, and it had humidifiers in the ceiling, but once we took ownership, we discovered that it was literally weeks away from being destroyed as it started, as they were starting to fail. There's pictures here of the Stolz Museum. It was created as a replica of a Victorian village, and it is something really stunning. The, um, the lady that created it, um, worked tirelessly on this on this and you know it's one of the, one of the most magnificent examples i know that mary said when she went there she spent hours and hours and some crawls of the with the dolls museum um so back to the gardens i mean the gardens themselves were impossible to walk in they were unsafe from years of neglect i couldn't even look at the gardens before i bought them you couldn't get down there I was told that the original gardening team loved the place so much that even once the previous owners stopped paying them, they all still came to work as long as possible to try and protect the garden. So it's amazing for the stories behind it. Um, I discovered that so many people in the community of West Sussex had strong ties and roots with Leonard Lee, 
and it's very much in the hearts of the county itself. Um, people, grandparents, um, we've got in the shed, in one of the garden sheds, there's a list of men that went to war in the, in the First World War who, who never returned. So it's, it's got so many different aspects of it. Um, I was once asked, you know, what, what, I, what I thought when I opened, you know, sort of went into the space for the first time. And I described it as being an amazing sleeping beauty. Um, that when you hacked back all the vines and all the, you know, the bushes, there was, it just transformed into this amazing, this amazing place. Um, the restoration, the restoration of the gardens um, took approximately two years and we were told that um, it certainly was one of the largest garden restoration projects in England and possibly Europe. So it's a very, been a very, very significant project as a whole. Um, the restoration, Stephen will talk in detail to you about that, you know, he's very passionate about this and we're very lucky to have him. Um, we opened the doors of Lenersley in March 2019 and in line with the other owners of the estate who'd been plant collectors from all over the world, we decided to plant vineyards. Um, and, you know, one of the thoughts was that if the soils could produce amazing, amazing rhododendrons, imagine what they could do for our vines. So very much Jack in the Beanstalk. We actually planted England's first pinotage vineyards in there, so a bit of South Africa into, into England, which again would complement our foray into English sparkling wine. Other standout moments for us include our Michelin star, which we awarded in October 19 for our restaurant interlude, which is situated in the mansion house at Lenesley. Our South African chef, Jean Delport, who operated our fine dining restaurant in Somerset West, moved to England with me as I told him that I thought there would be no other place like Lenesley Gardens. John is an outstanding fine dining chef and his whole menu is inspired from the gardens of Lenesley where he forages for his menu. Um, the stars were definitely aligned at the right time. We had the perfect chef, the perfect venue and, and, and luckily Michelin agreed with us. Our journey of course at Lenesley has only just begun. We're only one year in and we've been shut for several months, although we have recently re reopened to the public, obviously practicing great social distancing and the gardens being a huge area are very safe for people to come. And I think it becomes very poignant and clear that, you know, how important our open spaces and areas that we can escape and be proud of. So for us now, it's about conservation, looking after the gardens and preserving them for the future generations to come. I, I would like to hand over to our head garden, Stephen Harrington, who's actually down in the gardens at Lenesley's this evening, and he will take you on a magical journey around the gardens. Thank you. Hi there. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm joining you from uh, Lenesley, down by the, uh, the lakes, down by the engine house. Uh, it's been a bit of a mixed day today. Uh, been a lot of a bit of rain, a bit windy. Just now, my, most of my notes flew into the lake, so I was bathing around the lake, just pulling those out of the lake. So, uh, but yeah, I'd like to take you on a, a journey through uh, Lenersley, talking about the restoration as well. Um, I started at Lenersley in uh, September last year, so I missed the initial um, restoration. But it's an ongoing restoration. It's going to take a decade at least to restore this garden back to the splendour they were before they, they shut to the public. Um, after a long time of neglect, um, a, lot of, a lot of plants take over and it takes a long time to put, put that, um, that back to how it should be. So we've got a, a few years of restoration ahead of us, but what an exciting uh, project to be involved in. And I just want to take you uh, through a tour um, of the garden and talking about the restoration, a little bit about the history as well. Um, so I'm really hoping it doesn't rain. Uh, there is a few black cows in the sky, but I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get there. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you. There we go. So um, Lenersley is uh, famous um, for its rhododendron collections um, and it's and it's spring colour um, but there's there's a lot of interest throughout the year at Lenersley 
So um, we're, we're going through and building on that. So we want a garden that, that has all year round interest, but obviously showcases in, in the spring, but also in the autumn as well. So we want our visitors to see us the whole year round and enjoy this spectacular garden. So the garden is um, 240 acres. And this map here just shows the outline of the, the estate. Um, the original estate used to be around um, a thousand acres um, when it was originally owned by the, um, the Loder family. And it's quite funny, if you go to the back of the estate here, right up by the, the top, at the back of the woodland, you look over the fence in the farmer's fields, there's lots of um, Cedar of Lebanon's uh, trees and huge, big stately trees, which um, were a famous Victorian planting. And the farmers have just kind of plowed around them. So it's, it's really interesting to see how the estate would have, would have carried on. Um, so the garden is grade one listed, um, which is the highest listing you can get for, um, for a garden. And um, also the same listings apply to houses as well. So our house is grade two listed, but the garden is grade one listed, so it's, which means it's really, really important. Um, it has such a famous um, plant collection um, here. It's the whole aspect um, of, of the garden as well that makes it grade one listed. So um, there's a team of um, 17 um, gardeners and tree surgeons that maintain the garden. Um, so, you know, it sounds quite a lot. There's a lot of restoration work to do and a lot of trees to maintain as well. So um, it, it's a good team. And um, some of them have been here since the beginning of the restoration as well. So um, it's always good to chat to them. They've always got lots of information to tell me. Um, this picture here shows the estate um, just before the Second World War. This, was take, this picture was taken by, um, by a plane. Um, and it's very wooded here, but there was a big storm in the UK in 1987, um, which meant a lot of these trees came down in the 87 storm. But the garden generally hasn't changed from this, this layout here. And this picture here shows the estate um, now. This picture was taken um, April last year. But you can see all the, 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 the spring colour through there. And in the back uh, top corner there, just get a laser pointer. In the top corner there in the screen, this is where the, uh, the vineyard is at the moment. I think this picture was taken just before it was um, planted. Um, but this gives you an idea. This is just the area around the house. And there's, there's the Italian mansion there. Um, here is the rock garden here. Um, and then you head down into the valley, into the estate. So the, the garden is set, is set in a valley. It's set in a valley that goes like this, which is perfect for growing rhododendrons. All that cold air sweeps down from the top into, into the valley. So actually, if you come down here in the winter, in the mornings, it's about one degrees, two degrees colder down in the valley here. So all that cold air sweeps down, protecting the rhododendrons. But also, it's, it's a real pocket for rain as well. So it keeps moist um, in here. So it's perfect for rhododendrons. It really kind of mimics how they grow in, in the Himalayas, um, through Asia, China. Um, so it's a perfect setting. So here, this is a picture of um, Sir Edmund Loder, who um, he um, was really the, the key, the kind of main guy who um, kind of organized the estate and started planting up. So he was born in 1849 and he died in 1920. So he was here for around 30 years of his life. And he, he was a real collector. So um, he really, evolved the garden to what you see today and the other generations of the Loder family have added to it but we're still adding to it today as well so there's lots of future plans for replanting and establishing new collections so gardening is forever uh, evolving but he loved to collect rhododendrons and he signed up to collect a trip all around the world to the new plant hunters of, of uh, you know in the 1900s going out and collecting those plants and bringing them back to the UK but he liked to collect animals as well. So there was, there was beavers in the garden. We have um, wallabies still here in the gardens, um, uh, antelopes, uh, mountain goats, uh, kangaroos. So he was, a, he was a, a definite collector. So I want to take you on a, a tour of the gardens. And so as you saw from the map that I showed you earlier, this is um, our famous rock garden, um, which is at the top of the estate. So this is a picture here of, of when the rock garden was first planted in 1900. 
So it looks completely different to this now. Um, it was it was originally built to really hold alpine, alpines. But over the years, I'll show you some other pictures in a minute, it's evolved to, to be a rhododendron collection in there. Um, but this was built by Pullum and Sons, which were the famous rock garden designers of the time. If you wanted a rock garden built, you went to them. They built the one at Buckingham Palace, and they built the one at Wakehurst Place, just down the road. Um, they built them across the country. They were the go-to rock designers, rock garden designers of the time. Now, what's really, really uh, quite funny about our rock garden, if you come and visit and have a wander around, is there's, there's two different types of uh, rock in there. It's real uh, sandstone rock, which is quarried from the estate here. But also there's a special rock called pulamite, which was their special recipe. It was their secret recipe. They made a mixture of cement and sand and other products to make fake rock. And actually, if you go in there, it's, unless you've got your eye in, it's really hard to tell the difference. Um, they made this amazing rock garden in there. So this is the rock garden. Um, in, uh, in 2017, Penny was just telling you about the restoration of the estate, the estate the garden was in. And this is some early pictures. Um, so the rock garden was completely overgrown and everything was overgrowing e each other. So there used to be a team of around six or seven gardeners that maintained Leonardsley. And the one gardener used to work just in, in the rock garden here. And at one point when it was closed, it went down just to one gardener for 240 acres. So you can imagine the estate that, that the garden was in. So a long process, which we're still doing now, we're doing for many years, is finding those, those, those plants, uh, making sure they're labelled as well. We've got a big programme of cataloguing all the plants through the gardens here, making sure they're all labelled so um, the people visiting us know what the plants are, they can ask us questions around them, uh, putting it onto a plant database and mapping, mapping them, and making sure we propagate those plants as well. So, so as I said, some of them are so rare and unusual, you won't find them in many other gardens in, in the UK. So that picture there shows um, just as um, it came into the gardens in 2017, all completely overgrown. And behind that is, is a water feature and a pond. And this is it now, completely restored. So I took this picture um, at the beginning of the week here. And you can see um, the water feature has, has been, been restored there. So we've done a lot of work in the rock garden um, over the last um, six months. There was a huge amount of, uh, of conifers that were planted in the 70s as dwarf conifers, but um, they didn't say that dwarf. Uh, they were somewhere around 30 to 40 foot when we felled them. So they'd grown absolutely huge. So I'm always a bit uh, suspect about that term dwarf because things don't stay dwarf forever. So um, all those trees were felled, let so much more light into the rock garden, um, which allowed us to really see what we had there, allowed us to replant a lot more um, species rhododendrons and azalea rhododendrons through there as well. Um, allowed us to redo a lot of the rock work in there and and resurface the paths as well. So the paths have got a, a heritage gravel now put through them. So it, it's pretty much restored now. We've got a bit more herbaceous planting to do in there, but it looks absolutely fantastic in there. So different to um, what it looked like before. This is a picture into the rock garden here. Um, you've got the azalea. These are Japanese azalea type rhododendrons um, going out the rock garden. So another picture of the rock garden here. This is before we'd restored the paths, but you can see how, how, how much different it is. Nothing's completely overgrown um, from each other. There's a lot more lights coming into there as well. So every, every year in uh, July, we, um, we prune the azalea rhododendrons, these ones, and we'll mound them up into balls to, just to keep them tight because it's quite an enclosed space in the rock garden. There's a fantastic view from above there. And you can see the real, you know, fast, amazing colors there. So the garden is a real um, kaleidoscope of color. That, that, that word really describes the garden, kaleidoscope. And you either love it or hate it sometimes. The colors, I didn't really think about what colors went with what. As some areas are so um, in your face, they look amazing. Um, so we don't generally have to think about colour combinations, anything works in this garden, which is fantastic. So I'm going to now sweep down uh, through the garden. So moving on from the rock garden, this is a view across the top here, uh, down to the lakes. The lakes are, down, are just down here. This, this picture was taken in the autumn, very early in the morning, and the mist was, was raising up off, off the lakes. 
um, and it gave it a, a very a, a nice feeling that morning. So um, we head now into the uh, Loderai garden. This is one of the oldest parts of the garden. So this area was first planted up around 1801. So that's, that's the real start of the garden is around 1801. And it goes through many different stages. So 1801, there was a, 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 the garden was started to be developed here. In 1840, the Hubbard family really progressed with the garden, so much so um, that they actually bankrupt themselves, uh, building stone walls and paths. And they put the um, water supply into the garden as well in 1840. Sadly, it, it, it doesn't work anymore. But one really uh, interesting uh, fact is that if you see a, a small box hedge in the garden, it randomly plays through the woodland. You're, if, you, if you delve in, you'll find a water point in there. That's very Victorian. They didn't want to see the workings of the garden, but they wanted water points, but they wanted to cover them up. So they covered them up with box hedging. But this takes you through into the Loderai garden, which is one of the oldest parts of the garden. And then it was heavily planted up by um, Sir Edmund Loder um, in 1898. And as I said, he signed up to these collection trips all around the world and started to plant them back in the garden. Uh, this is uh, a Loderai rhododendron here. This is Venus. And you know, when this is flowering, you know that the garden's at the height of its flowering. So it normally flowers around the 14th of May. But this year, we were around two weeks um, ahead of flowering, just because the winter was so mild here that we're at least two weeks ahead. And that's gone through the whole season. We're still two weeks ahead of where we should be. So things are flowering a lot earlier this year. But this year has been one of the best years for flowering of rhododendrons across the country. It's been absolutely fantastic. So it's a real shame that we were closed, but they look absolutely spectacular. And the rhododendrons really start flowering. We have some that flower around Christmas time, the winter, and they push on right till the end of June. Some still flower through July as well. So there's, there's a lot of interest through the garden. Um, you can see the paths down through here. About 10 miles of paths were restored across the garden. So they used to be just grass paths and with a small amount of gravel. But the garden never used to be opened all, all year round. It was only opened in the spring for a couple of weeks in the autumn. But, it was, but we really kind of made the decision, actually, if we want people to enjoy the garden the whole year round, which is what we wanted, they need to be able to move around the garden safely and be able to access the whole of the garden. So the path net network was changed um, to a gravel, um, very naturalistic uh, gravel, but it, um, just to allow access the whole year round. Some more of our, our um, azalea type rhododendrons through here. This picture really shows how um, we like to manage the garden. It's managed in a very naturalistic style. Um, so the naturalistic movement was started by William Robinson um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he actually lived um, in a house and an estate not far from here called Gravetime Manor. So we, we kind of carry on that thing. It was a real push against the Victorian's bedding schemes. It was a real movement of planting gardens in the mo most naturalistic style as possible. You can see from this picture that we, we like bluebells at the edge of the paths. You know, what some people may uh, see as weeds in their gardens, but we leave them. We like foxgloves. We, we like ferns to naturalize themselves around the garden. Um, so in a way, sometimes it's harder to manage a garden and to, to look as natural as possible than it is to highly manage a garden. So you went in and weeded just everything out. So we really uh, pick what we leave and what we take out. We want that feeling where people are immersed in the garden and, and they, they feel like they are in the Himalayas is, 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 is what we're trying to achieve. So this is some of my favorite rhododendrons through the uh, Loderai garden. Um, this is rhododendron Macbianum. Um, and this, um, this was introduced from China. This is one of the original um, introductions. Um, this was introduced in the early 1900s. And by someone called Frank Kingdom Ward. It's about five key plant collectors that are around that time, the golden age of plant collecting, um, who um, people signed up to their trips and Sir Edmund Loder signed up to these trips. There's quite a few um, properties around here. Sussex is famous for its gardens. It, it's a real hot spot for gardens. So if you love gardens, Sussex is the place to come to see, see gardens. Um, you know, there's there's dozens and dozens of fantastic famous gardens in Terry. They all swap plants, shared plants, shared cuttings, and talk to each other. And we still carry on that tradition now. We swap plants and, and we all meet up and talk to each other and, I, and 
help each other identify plants. Sir Edmund Loder um, signed up to these collecting trips and then everybody who signed up got seeds. And this is one of the original seed introductions. And this is from China. This is another uh, rhododendron from China. Uh, this is rhododendron Faulkneri. And this was collected by someone called Chinese Wilson, who predominantly collected in China. How he got his nickname, Chinese Wilson. This is a very large leaf rhododendron. It has huge leaves. And it loves really moist, uh, damp conditions in the shade. But the flowers, you get a, a flower head like this kind of size. It's a beautiful plant. So um, these, are, these are absolutely fantastic rhododendrons. These are the Loderi rhododendrons, which were bred by um, Sir Edmund Loder. And um, he bred these in around 1901, and they've won, won lots of um, awards. And what's so unusual about these rhododendrons is they've got very large flowers, but they're scented. And there's not many rhododendrons that are scented. Um, so there's about 20 Loderis, and we have pretty much most of these in the garden. We're still searching around for the odd few others, um, but we think we've catalogued most of them in the garden. Um, but some of these are, are very unusual. You won't find them any, anywhere else. And um, they've just kind of died out of cultivation. So our plan is, is to get these micro crops. So you, you, set, you send a small part of the leaf and it's grown in a, in a laboratory on um, uh, agar gel, which is made out of seaweed. And then seven years time, you get a plant back. And what we want to do is, is to plant a lot more here um, so, so they don't die out of cultivation. This is another one, this is Loderi King George, um, which is, uh, has these beautiful big scented flowers. And, and the ones here, as I say, are what, 120 years old now. And they've got huge big stems, uh, which, which are really nice red bark. And, and these are predominantly grown through the Loderi garden. So I'm sweeping down out of the Loderi garden, and this is down into the, into the dale. And there's a small stream that runs through here. Um, and there's, it, there's a lot of old Victorian uh, pipes that run through here. And there's a stream and a set of small ponds down through here. But when the, uh, whilst the garden became uh, derelict, um, these had all silted up, and the ponds have silted up now, and the brambles have taken over, and there's a, there's a big... Um, giant redwood trunk in the middle of the dale here. It's huge. It's, it must be about a meter and a half a, a, across. So what we want to do going forward is, is to unsilt that, that, the small stream and those ponds and take out those logs and replant this with primulas and other woodland plants. I, I should have said this is a, this is a woodland garden. So um, we want to we want to install that that underplanting of woodland plants to extend interest but also to cover the ground and and, and protect things and keep moisture into the roots of the, of the rhododendrons. So the garden team has spent many an hour digging out brambles through those areas. Um, brambles are, are, are a big problem. But another weed we have is this here, which what a beautiful weed to have, I always think. This is rhododendron luteum. This is a very late um, deciduous. So some rhododendrons are deciduous. They lose their leaves in the, in the winter. Um, they're later flowering. So these have only really just gone over and they flower for about three weeks. So this yellow one here is rhododendron luteum and it's got a beautiful sweet scent to it. So walking around the garden about three weeks ago, you, on the air you just smelt this fragrance of this rhododendron. But it is a bit of a weed here. It does spread around and it grows everywhere and it suckers. So what we, what we do is at certain clumps every five years, we'll go through um, and cut them down to the ground and let them come back up again. So, and some areas we dig them out and move them around, but yeah, it, it, it can take over if you don't control it. This is a close up of the flower here. This is one of the best selling plants that we have in our plant sales in the spring. Um, everybody will want to take one of these home. Everyone's asking what's that yellow, um, what's that fragrant plant? So um, yeah, it's a, it's a big hit in our plant sales. This is, a, this is another um, deciduous rhododendron here as well, again, late, late flowering. What's so nice about the deciduous ones is, is they don't have many leaves on them when they, they flower and they're a lot shorter as well. So you can really see that it's so bright, this bright orange. And these, are, these are down through the dale. Some more of them here and they're all mostly scented. So it gives that real another kind of aspect to the garden, the scent, the touch, the feel and the atmosphere. 
So this is a view. So you sweep down through the dale, you, you walk up the hill a little bit, and then you get a view from the memorial table right down the middle of the lakes. Um, and this is, some of our views have started to go. Things have kind of grown up and taken over. But really restoring a, a garden is, 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 is getting that balance between what do you put back to um, was originally there? Should you open up that view that's been lost? So it's getting that balance between going back, um, you know, doing the research, thinking about what was here, but actually thinking about where the future is going, especially with, um, you know, climate change, um, a lot of pests and diseases coming into um, uh, all countries around the world, but in the UK as well. So a lot of pests and diseases we never had before. So it's really thinking about how we manage the garden for future generations and what we go back to, but what we change. And I think that's one thing about views as well. So this, this was a view. And that view has started to be lost slightly with the rhododendron overgrowing at the top here, but it's such a beautiful rhododendron and it's so big, it, it must be 30 foot high that I really don't feel we can prune that back. So actually it's about creating other windows and views through the garden, not always looking back, but also looking forward as well. You sweep down through, through the dale and this picture really does show actually when you need to make these tough decisions. A lot of these rhododendrons, as you can see, are quite woody at the bottom. And some of our rhododendrons are 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot high. And the flowers are right at the top. So and that's why I always say, if you're walking around, around the garden, don't always look down, look up. Because sometimes the only reason you know, you know a rhododendron is flowering near you is if you see the petals on the ground. And you think, well, where is that? Where's that, that plant? Or just as I'm talking to you, there's an albino wallaby that's just popped past me on the other side of the lake. Um, and so you've got to make these tough decisions through here is should this rhododendron be cut down really and then let, let it re-sprout up so we are making those decisions as we go through and we're working on a management plan of the garden so so we re restore but restore in a very careful and sensitive way this is a lovely uh, camellia here this is camellia showgirl we've got a fantastic collection of camellias through the garden as well and we've got a big collection of winter flowering uh, camellias that come from Japan, uh, the Sasanqua types. And, and those are kind of things that we want to build on, those winter flowering camellias. But also looking at um, other things like we planted 45,000 snowdrops um, this year across the garden. And we planted another 60,000 early flowering daffodils. So it's, it's, you know, we've got great autumn colour, but then it's thinking about interest for the winter as well but may as i said before really really light touches on all of these things as well but but a, a mass a flowering of snowdrops looks look, you come down here in the winter and you just see a field of white so we want to carry on that we want to plant another fifty thousand snowdrops this year and just have that ongoing interest so so all through the year people think yeah let's go and visit lenazy there's something to see there this is, so I'm sweeping down now to the lakes. We've got seven lakes uh, down in the valley here where I'm sat. Uh, and these date back to, um, to the, around the 1500s, um, some of them. We have New Lake right at the end there. It's, you think the name would suggest it's fairly new, but it's 1740 it was, it was dug. So it's not, it's not that new. It's been around for a while. Uh, but it gives a real ambience here and it, it allows the garden to, to have that real feeling down here as well. So we've got seven large lakes running through the middle of the garden and this picture here shows you this was taken uh, again about 1910 um, of what the lakes used to look like. We've got a lot of work to do here replanting all these marginal plants right through the, the garden. But I don't know if you can see just at the back here there's a Japanese bridge, a wooden bridge that goes across the, the ponds and I've got a close-up of that as well and I think wouldn't it be great to put that bridge back across the, uh, the lake. I, I don't know what Penny thinks about that, but I think it'd be fantastic. So this is, I got some pictures here of the lakes that were taken uh, in 2017, um, when the, the estate started to be restored. You can see how green they are with all the duckweed there. You can see all the bracken, big problem with bracken as well. That's one of our major weeds is bracken here. Um, you've, you've got a lot of birch seedlings that have come in here and seeded themselves. Um, and a lot of uh, sedge grass through here as well. So the lakes had become really constricted uh, and, and there was, they needed to be dredged as well. 
So a number of uh, the lakes have already been dredged. Um, there's work going forward in the future to look at how the water moves through these lakes. Some areas of lakes were widened up and we've got a lot of work to do of replanting the marginal plants because um, without them, the, the lakes um, aren't so secure. Um, if we, have a, we had a really wet winter and a lot of water coming over the tops of the lakes and it started to wash areas away. So we've got to be really careful on how we manage the lakes and making sure that they're properly dammed up as well. You can see here how silted this lake here was. Um, so these have been opened up and they're, and they're running through again now. This is a picture of the lake uh, now. So um, how much clearer it looks. Um, and this is a view right down here. So I'm sat about here on this picture. Uh, this was taken a few weeks ago. You can see the luteum in flower. And then this plant here from, um, from Brazil is um, Gunnera. Um, it has huge leaves. They're, they're a meter and a half long. Um, it's, and in the winter, we cut the leaves down and, and put them over the top of the plant to protect it from the frost. So the engine house is uh, actually just behind me where I'm sat. And this is a picture of where, when it was taken um, again in 2017. So what you've got here is all the brambles, the grass path, um, all the ivy over the engine house here, and all this rhododendron ponticum, which is a big, big problem weed. Um, this engine house was built to pump up water to the main house. So the main house is at the top of the hill, just up behind me, and it was used to pump the water up to the main house. It had a big um, engine inside it, a steam engine, and it, you know, it was fed, they had to feed it coal in there as well, and the water was pumped up to the main house. But I've, there was a, I was doing some research and I found a story that said um, that the water was fairly clean, but sometimes they found the odd bug or a twig in the water. So the filters probably didn't work the, the best. And uh, at the moment, we're just uh, restoring this engine house as well. Um, the roof had started to, to rot quite badly. Um, so the, again, these pictures were only taken a few weeks ago. So the roof is now back on um, and um, it's been restored and protected. It was very damp in there as well. And we're actually turning it into, into a cafe. So when people get right down into the middle of the, middle of the state here, they, they can have some re refreshments. And you get these, you sit out and look at these beautiful um, views around the lake here. This is a view of the engine house across. Um, you can see how different, I showed you that pitch, all this was completely overgrown all through here. So all that had to be cleared. So there was really two years. So uh, the garden was opened again in 2019, April 2019. There was two years of just going through and clearing and opening up, um, which was, doing so much uh, hard work to clear the brambles and the nettles and, and, and cut down the trees and, the, and remove the, the rhododendrons. And, and so it's really opened up now. But as I said before, there's a huge amount more work to do of replanting. It's been years since a lot of replanting has been done through the estate. A lot of the plants are the same age. And you're in a real danger of, um, there's a really bad storm, all those old plants coming down at the same time. So it's, it's about managing that and making sure you, you, you have different generations of plants through the garden. So again, this is a view down through the lakes. This was taking it in the winter. See how much clearer they are. And this was taken in the autumn. Of the lakes as well. I, I said before, we've got an amazing autumn colour here. The garden has got beautiful autumn colour. Um, this is a picture of the waterfall. So there's um, there's a number of waterfalls which connect each lake, um, which um, run with water. But sadly, in the summer, if it's really really dry, they, they uh, those those as the lake levels drop, those dry up. So we have. We have a plan to put a big pump in so water constantly flows around the lakes and allows those water features to constantly run. I mean, we haven't had proper rain probably here now for eight weeks or so, um, but it, it's still running because we had such a wet winter, there's still water in, in the course. Because our lakes are fed by water up, upstream. Um, there's fantastic bluebells here. There's, there's um, hills full of bluebells. Um, which flower in, in May. And they looked, again, they looked absolutely fantastic this year. 
Um, but these are some of the snowdrops that we've been planting. As I said, we planted around 45,000 snowdrops. So we planted two species. We planted the native British uh, species, uh, Navalis, which has got a beautiful, just single flower um, um, snowdrop. Again, it's, it's really keeping that naturalistic style. It, we just we want it to be as natural as possible. If we're going to introduce anything in, in there, so the bluebells are native bluebells, and we wanted to make sure that we carried on that thing. And then we have another one called um, Alwesii, which is which is a big, bigger um, snow, snowdrop. But yeah, they were all planted by hand. We didn't use any machinery. So I think after about two or three weeks, the garden team, um, I think, had seen enough of the snow trouble. But they, you know, when they came down and saw them flowering, they, they were really pleased with their, with their work. This is a big problem, this uh, rhododendron here. It looks beautiful when it's in flower. It has a really nice purple flower. But it really does get out of hand. And this rhododendron was introduced again in the Victorian times um, for... To, to plant on bigger states to uh, for hide um, uh, birds, grouse and, fe and um, pheasants for shoots, give them cover. But it's completely got out of hand um, and it poisons the soil around it and it's very difficult to get rid of. So we have a program of reducing a lot of this ponticum and replanting up areas as well. So it, it takes over, it just swamps everything. And again, this is this is a picture of the garden in the in the autumn. This is Asa palmatum, and you can just see how much autumn colour is here. This this is a really beautiful um, um, Asa here. Yeah, so um, we've um, we've got fallow deer which uh, roam, roam freely through the estate, um, and then we've got some of the the wallabies there's around 40 to 50 it's difficult to know how many that are, are wild throughout the estate and then we have a nursery enclosure for some of the wallabies as well and um, that's where the joeys are born and we've got four joeys that were born this year to so the baby wallabies um, but what i didn't mention is there's a huge amount of wildlife through this estate um, there's, there's kingfishers a lot of birds of prey there's owls and bats so it's a real haven for wildlife so whatever we do we, we we really respect the, the environment here and, and, and look after the wildlife as much as possible. Stephen, thank you so much. It was an incredible presentation and to see you actually sitting outside there at Leonard's Lee when we're sitting in the dark here has been <laughs> a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. And Penny, all the best with all your incredible initiatives 